Hello. Oh, wow. That was kind of, uh, was not expecting it to be so loud. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to give everybody a chance to come in and get seated, and we're going to get our meeting started. So as a few um, people come in and find their seats, I want to personally thank you all for joining us today at our annual membership meeting. I'm very excited for today's activities. We have a lot of things planned. And we'll also, um, hopefully, when the trade show opens a little bit later, we'll have opportunities for you guys to make connections and find benefits to help build your businesses. We're going to go ahead and get started. This meeting is a great way for ABOR members to engage with industry leaders, such as this year's keynote speaker, chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, Lawrence Yoon. Before we begin our program, though, I'd like to bring up Kara McGregor with Independence Title. And of course, without sponsors like her and our other affiliates, we would not be able to put this program together. So thank you. Let's welcome Kara. What does it mean to buy a home, a business, a piece of dirt in Texas? It means joining a vibrant community and committing to the future we can build together. Independence Title stands right beside you on your piece of Texas dirt. We have helped hundreds of thousands of people find their way home, open businesses, and invest in their future. At Independence Title, we know getting it right means more than crunching the numbers and closing the deal. It means reaching out and checking in. It means working hard and celebrating the small things. Getting it right means caring about people and earning respect. Independence Title is homegrown in Texas and dedicated to supporting the communities we serve. All jobs are staffed locally and our network of relationships is as deep and wide as Just Texas. Declare your independence you stay, and welcome home. Stand by me. Stand by me. I love that commercial. <laughs> um, I'm Karen McGregor with Independence Title. I have the privilege and honor of leading our business development effort there. Uh, I know many of you are connected with our escrow and sales teams, and we work hard every day to be a positive part of your business. Um, when Independence Title formed almost 14 years ago now, one of the top things on our priority to-do list was to become an affiliate member of ABOR. Um, it's a significant relationship for us through these years, and it continues to be so, and I appreciate you turning out to support our board. So uh, without further ado, the other thing I'm supposed to do today is introduce our speaker. Today, we're joined by NAR's chief economist and senior vice president of research, Dr. Lawrence Yoon. Dr. Yoon creates NAR's forecasts and participates in many economic and forecasting panels, among them the Blue Chip Council and the Harvard University Industrial Economist Council. He also oversees and is responsible for a wide range of research activity for the National Association, including NAR's existing home and sales statistics, affordability index, and home buyers and sellers profile report. Dr. Yoon appears regularly on financial news outlets and is a frequent speaker at real estate conferences throughout the United States. He's testified before Congress, he's a frequent guest on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, and is a regular guest columnist on the Forbes website. Today, Dr. Yoon will provide an economic update at the national level and address localized concerns that impact you and your clients. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Yoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction uh, and also uh, Independence Title for the sponsorship. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, President Brandy Guthrie from Austin Board of Realtors for also arranging so that I can be uh, here. Um, uh, interesting times uh, in real estate. Uh, Austin uh, certainly uh, is in a better location, uh, has been uh, one of the solid real estate market uh, in the country, uh, but now one is encountering, at least at the localized level, uh, some affordability challenges and also infrastructure issues uh, as companies consider expanding 
uh, and many of the California-based companies, specifically high technology companies, uh, as they were seeking to expand, uh, they always looked towards where are their educated workforce along with uh, a very business-friendly climate, and many have chosen Austin as a choice of location, uh, but now uh, with the inventory levels, at least no longer declining, but still at a very low levels, which is now leading to affordability challenges and then the infrastructure where you have enough system to continue to maintain this super fast uh, job growth uh, in the local area. At the national level, the interesting new information is the tax reform. Uh, in front of your uh, table, uh, there is a small uh, a thing about urgent uh, call for action. Uh, I believe you will be receiving, if you are in the system of National Association of Realtors, uh, email uh, indicating that uh, there will be some tax reform, one aspect which we are very concerned about. Tax reform must occur because we are tired of spending so much time and effort on April 15th to do the tax return. We are tired of it. We want a simplified system. So uh, it is a very noble goal that we want to pursue, but we don't want to have an unintended consequences of raising taxes unintentionally, you know, you see, uh, raising taxes on homeowners. Um, and we believe that as is currently proposed, that it could possibly raise the taxes on homeowners. So we want to at least let the elected officials, members of Congress, uh, well aware of our concerns. Uh, now, uh, Kevin Brady is the uh, leader of the House of Representatives doing the tax reform. Uh, he is uh, representing the, one of the congressional districts in the state of Texas. And one of the things he said is, yeah, look, this is only a proposal, initial for just the discussion. Let's get the discussion going. If you have any concern, and he is talking to all the uh, groups, if one has any concerns, let me know. And he will try to modify and to see uh, how things could work. So again, uh, we uh, believe that tax reform must occur, simplify it, but anything that impacts home buying or raises the taxes on homeowners, uh, we would be very concerned uh, about that. I will go into more specific about the uh, tax reform and why uh, it may be hurting uh, homeowners or home buying. Uh, but before that, I want to just go over the broad uh, market conditions because the market condition is clearly implying things are good, uh, but now we don't want some policy issues to disrupt that change. Um, I will go into the national and then go into the local uh, information because many of the trends that impacts the national level uh, are so filtered down to the local level. Uh, in fact, one you can even say that whatever happens at nation in Austin, things are a little better than nation. So you can view it in that reference point. So this is the uh, overall home sales activity uh, from year 2000. And as you are engaged in market, you may encounter some home buyers who are expressing some concern. Are we re-entering a second housing market bubble? Because certainly it appears that if a home is listed, there is a multiple buyers ready to pounce. Uh, not enough inventory, the days on the market is very short. So it has some feel for very active housing market condition. But one can see from this chart that we are nowhere near 2005 easy subprime lending days. So even though home sales are recovering, it is not the, uh, the easy subprime lending days of 2005, implying a more healthier uh, recovery. Uh, so even though it, uh, days on the market very, very quick, it is fundamentally different. The people who are obtaining mortgages today are they are of much solid credit. Uh, in fact, one would say if it's overly stringent, uh, particularly people with fluctuating incomes, people, small business owners, realtors, home builders, uh, who are based on commission incomes, uh, it makes it even more extraordinarily difficult to obtain mortgages. So it is not back to 2005 
So any concern that people may express that are we entering a second housing market bubble, uh, I would just dismiss it because fundamentally the data shows that we are nowhere near 2005 and second, the mortgage underwriting condition is fundamentally uh, different. Now zooming in to more recent years of the home sales, what you see is that for the most years from 2008, the low point, the home sales have been rising. Home sales have been rising uh, mostly. Austin doing much better than the national in terms of the percentage growth. But there were two occurrences where home sales declined modestly or just took a little pause. One was in 2009-2010. What happened there? If you remember back in 2008, uh, it was the condition where foreclosures were rising, people were not buying homes, and as part of that, NAR committee uh, discussed it and said, how can we get people who have stable jobs back into the market? Because home buying is such a major expenditure, you don't want to buy a depreciating asset. If you know you have the financial capacity, but if you believe home prices will go down even more, you will hold back. So that holding back will really uh, make the market worse than what it could be. So we lobby for home buyer tax credit. So back in 2008, if you remember 2009, there was something called $8,000 home buyer tax credit. Buy a home and get this $8,000. So that stimulated people to get back into the market and it actually worked exactly as it intended. It stopped the bleeding in housing. Prices no longer declined as people began to come into the market, but it was not going to be a permanent home buyer tax credit. It was stimulative short term. And once that tax credit ended, there was a modest decline in home sales. But now the job creation is bringing buyers into the market, but there was still a modest uh, decline in home sales. Then we saw the home sales of them begin to rise with job creation until 2014. Slight decline in 2014. So what happened in 2014? It was just the off-the-cuff comment by Ben Bernanke, the chair of the Federal Reserve, to a question from a reporter. And I forget the exact phrasing of the question, but to make it very simple, the question was, are you ever going to stop printing money? Because uh, part of the stimulus measure uh, was also pursuing an easy monetary policy, zero interest rate policy on the short-term interest rates, along with printing of a lot of money. And what did they do with the printed money? They bought government uh, bonds, they bought mortgage-backed securities in order to, to keep the interest rates low, mortgage rates low. So the question, posed to Ben Bernanke was, when are you going to stop printing money, or something like that? And Ben Bernanke just replied, yeah, surely we cannot print money forever, or something. And then as soon as he made that remark, just overnight, mortgage rate changed from 3.5% to 4.5%. So as a real estate practitioner, who has been in the business for many, many years, you say 4.5% mortgage rate? Those are attractive mortgage rates. Yet for consumers who have been accustomed to 3.5 or serious buyers who are trying to sign contract at 3.5%, suddenly rise to 4.5% mortgage rate, they are holding back. So we saw a slight decline in home sales because of the sudden increase in mortgage rate back in 2014. Now after that comment, and after several months, mortgage rate did go back down again, uh, but that initial shock uh, uh, brought surprise to uh, many consumers. Now, 2016 uh, was a, you know, one of the better home sales in many, many years, and jobs are still being created. There's no recession in sight. But what's going to happen in 2017? Well, we are well into 2017. And it was possible to make a reasonable forecast of modest decline in home sales in 2017 this year. Why? because of the surprise election results of Donald Trump, President Trump. And I think even Donald Trump will admit that on the election night he didn't think that he would win, but uh, uh, so, so whether uh, you know, to the dismay of many or to the elation uh, of, you know, this, uh, we are in a highly polarized country, but it was a surprise election results. 
On that election night, if you remember, stock market futures were tanking about 500 points. Um, mortgage rates changed from 3.5% to 4.2%, essentially overnight, well, from that election results. Now, why would the mortgage rate change from a surprise election results at the presidential uh, level? Well, some people may view it as, well, with President Trump coming in, he is clearly pro-business, meaning that economy will strengthen, job growth will uh, be much more robust, wages will pick up. That means we don't need low interest rate policy anymore. You need low interest rate policy when the economy is soft and weak. If the economy will be stronger, we don't need a low interest rate environment anymore. So some people may have uh, thought that way as to why the interest rate in increase. Other people would have said, well, President Trump campaigned on big tax cut, combined with increase in infrastructure spending, military upgrade, and building the wall, a lot of government spending. So big tax cut combined with increased government spending means higher budget deficit. Higher budget deficit means that if you have to borrow more and more money, then you have to pay higher interest rates. Just like in your personal business, if you have to borrow more and more, the banks will say, I have to charge you slightly higher, you are borrowing a little excessively. So the interest rate increase, so was it the case of better economic outlook? Or is it the case of budget deficit possibly worsening? Well, we don't know the actual reason because global financial market is global. They are German mutual funds buying and selling. There are Wall Street companies buying and selling. You have mom and pop investors buying and selling, Chinese government buying and selling. So it's all this confluence of reason, but that confluence of reason said mortgage interest rates should be a little higher after the presidential election and interest rates were higher. So go back to 2013 about Ben Bernanke printing of the money, when will stop printing money. Interest rate increased from 3.5 to 4.5. Presidential election increased from 3.5 to 4.2, not 4.5, but 4.2. But nonetheless, it is a measurable increase. So one expect maybe home sales would diminish from sudden increase in interest rate, very similar condition. So this is the mortgage rate at that. So first circle is Ben Bernanke comment about not printing money forever. The second circle is President Trump's surprise election results uh, that occurred. So here is what happened. Home sales in December, post-election, higher compared to December of year before. This is at the national level. Austin is always doing better than the national. Fit, uh, home sales in January, higher compared to the year before. February, higher compared to the year before. Every single month of this year to date, home sales have been higher compared to the one year before. So even though interest rates were higher, consumers are saying, I don't care. I am in the market. I'm going to buy that home. Let's look at the newly constructed home. Essentially, the similar story. More new home sales, except only the most recent couple of months where we are seeing some declines in new home sales. So unlike Ben Bernanke interest rate surprise, this President Trump's interest rate surprise appear not to have any impact on home buying. Home buyings are actually higher uh, going in. Why could this be the case? Well, we, NAR takes survey of randomly selected consumers across the country and asks various questions, including a simple one, is it a good time to buy? Just the sentiment about buying a home. The vertical line is the election period. So you can see how many people said it is good time to buy before election. And now after election, figures are higher. The second quarter, there was a dip. Then third quarter, suddenly came back up higher. So from consumers' point of view, they're saying it is better time to buy post-election compared to pre-election. Now we have to recognize, you just turn on television in the evening, cable news network, it is a highly polarized country. We know that. But on average, consumers, as related to home buying, they are saying it is better time to buy a home now than before the election. Stock market. Stock market futures on the election night was down. But the next day, when the stock market opened, it actually closed higher. And then it went up, 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 and continued to test new highs as even of today. So stock market is saying, the American economy prospect looks much better now than before the election. 
animal spirit of consumers. The animal spirit is an economist term and not a biological term uh, that you may want to talk about. So uh, it's a term that uh, John Maynard Keynes had used in his book to say that psychology can actually have a big influence on the economy. So what does that mean? If people feel good, they will go out and spend money. And if they go out and spend money, then companies will have to hire more people. And if they hire more people, then the new workers will have salaries and they go out and spend money, multiplier, positive multiplier. Same thing going backwards. If people don't have confidence, they stop spending money. Companies have to lay off workers, and it worsens the situation, a uh, downward spiral uh, backwards. So there is a company in New York who's been tracking consumer confidence for about 70, 80 years, consistent way. And just asking questions, how do you feel about the economy? How are your finances? And those type of questions. And you can see post-election, consumer confidence is much higher. So again, we are in a very divided, polarized country, but on average, consumers are feeling better uh, about the economic prospects. Animal spirit of the business, asking questions to small business owners. Now, small business owners all favor lower tax rates, uh, things that President Trump had been saying, so small business owners uh, were just a thrill uh, on the election result, I think, on average. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, much greater optimism on, on the uh, business condition. So interest rates are higher after the election, but unlike back in 2013 when Ben Bernanke caused interest rates to rise, the President Trump's impact on the interest rate appear not to have any impact, negative impact on home sales. Home sales are rising, rising, rising uh, condition because people on average are feeling better. But one thing that is holding back the housing market growth potential. I mean, first, we are thankful that housing market is recovering, but it could be even stronger. And one constraint is that the builders are not building enough homes. That horizontal blue line that you see is a 50-year average on single-family housing starts in the country. The red line is the actual construction. So we are improving in terms of actual construction, but as you can see, we are still well under historical average. And this is the reason why you have inventory shortage. You are saying, well, I have a consumers Rather than trying to constantly outbid other consumers, if we had more inventory, people can make decision uh, without hurrying that decision, you know, feel comfortable about that uh, condition. We can have more inventory. Now, I know that most of your consumers do not buy newly constructed homes, but new construction helps overall inventory. How? Builders build it. A homeowner trade up to that newly constructed building they now release that existing home onto the market. So it causes the chain reaction. But the builders have been not building. And why are they not building? Four reasons, four principal reasons. One is lot shortage. The local officials, I don't know all the details about Austin, but it's the Austin government officials holding back on some of the zoning approvals, housing permit issuance. Instead, holding back some of the uh, requirement to have more housing starts. The other one is labor shortage, construction worker shortage. Now, it is widely known in the industry, but something people do not want to actively discuss, which is at construction sites, there are many undocumented illegal immigrants working at construction sites. Now, with the rhetoric of Donald Trump about uh, the, the illegal immigrants, as well as building the wall, is this limiting the construction worker availability? Now, I will ask another completely separate question. Why come we don't have domestic construction workers? Because construction workers pay good middle-income jobs. Why can we not get more domestic workers into the profession? Have we changed, America has changed, so that every high school graduate somehow have to go to four-year college rather than more trade school into construction, electrician, lumber framing, bricklaying? Uh, because we are short on the construction workers, and they pay good, decent middle-income salaries. If we think about it, our grandparents, great-grandparents, all worked in physical labor. It was very demanding. And they wanted their children to be, live a better life, but nonetheless, they were in very physically demanding uh, work. 
Now, today's construction work, by the way, is not like the old days construction work. You know, you have all this machinery, you know, you can pick up that, so, so you have a lot of machinery to help you out. This is less difficult. But still, one has to wonder why uh, many um, Americans are not going into construction. Uh, because even though the job itself, it is more fiscally demanding than office jobs, uh, but it pays good middle-income uh, uh, salaries. When you ask your grandparents about how did you like your job back then, you know, those fiscal things, they said, well, it was difficult, but they had certain pride in that job. And what was that pride? Very simply, they were breadwinners. They could help out the family. But now we have a situation where we have a sizable number of working age population not even in the labor force. I don't know if the opioid epidemic is uh, holding back some labor force participation or not, but we have to wonder why don't we have more domestic workers going into construction industry, whether trade skills uh, or even just the spirit of saying, you know, I want to help out the family, but we have sizable number of Americans who are just completely out of the labor force, not even uh, looking for a job. So we have a labor shortage that's holding back construction. The other part is the lending. I'm glad to see every time a large home builders like Lennar, KB Homes, Toll Brothers report their earnings to say they had a good year or they're improving, they're having more orders. But historically, more home building was done by mom and pop builders rather than those big builders. But today, it is the big builders who are building and not mom and pop. Why are the mom and pop builders not in the game? Because trying to obtain construction loans today is much more difficult. As part of the financial regulation, specifically known as Dodd-Frank regulation, it has really hampered small size banks, community banks, from making those loans. Because small size banks are saying, look, we are hiring two, three additional people. And these two and three additional people are not loan officers, but they are compliance officers, lawyers, to make sure all the paperwork is straight. So community banks, because of Dodd-Frank regulations, are ha the hamper from making those loans to these mom and pop home builders. I think there is a consensus developing in Washington to say that Dodd-Frank perhaps is good for those Wall Street companies, big banks, but it is clearly not good for the small size community banks and let's lift those regulations from those small community banks. And if the Dodd-Frank is somehow uh, the lesson, that, that, that area is lesson, then I think you will see more mom and pop get in, back into the game because they can obtain those construction loans. Now I do hear from mom and pop builders, they are able to get construction loans, but a little differently. Before the regulation, they would get the loan to build 10 homes. Today they get the loan to build only two homes, find a buyer, repay that loan, and then they get the loan to build more, two more homes. So you can see much slower process of participation uh, than before. So maybe there will be something about relaxing financial regulation on small community banks, which means more mom and pop home builders can get into the game. And finally, the lumber. Uh, the lumber prices are rising, um, and uh, with the hurricane impacting Houston, there will be a lot of additional uh, increased demand for lumber. Uh, so anytime material cost rises, you know, that will also hold back some uh, home building activity. Um, and from the builder's perspective, they are just saying that on average, whatever they build, spec home, they can find a buyer in 2.9 months on average, which is a very fast pace. So builders don't have any problem finding a buyer, they just cannot build enough homes. And because they cannot build enough homes, you as real estate uh, professionals are saying, where's the inventory, where's the inventory? Well, the builders are just not building an uh, adequate number of homes. This is the Austin Metro housing permit for multifamily, essentially apartments. Uh, so that peak is the end of the year, December. So you see that in December it's peak, then in the January of the following year is low, and then it goes, builds up. So this is year-to-date figure. So you can see that on apartment building, Austin is very active. So, so there's plenty of apartment building going on. They're just very, very active. Uh, but it is the single family construction which is dragging behind compared to uh, what it had been. So just inadequate. Now back in the year 2000, uh, you can say we are matching up to year 2000, but remember Austin is a fast growing city. Many people from California are moving in, many people from other regions of the country are like moving in, jobs are being created, uh, so there needs to be a strong increase, boost in housing starts for single family, but that 
Directionally, it's occurring, but still, I would say, inadequate uh, levels. Uh, and in the meantime, this is the data from August. September figure came out yesterday or today, uh, which showed that home sales, September in Austin is little down from September of last year. So first half of the year in Austin, all the way through uh, August, I guess first three quarters, were very solid. But now you are beginning to see a little decline, and I think this decline is not due to jobs becoming more uncertain, you still have strong job creation. What is uncertain is inventory choices and affordability challenges that comes from uh, uh, inventory shortage. You don't have enough home, home prices rise too fast, prices rise, some of your buyers are just priced out. Uh, so that is the reason why you are beginning to see home sales in Austin uh, beginning to go down. But not prices. Prices still run up because housing shortage. Housing shortage means prices uh, continue to run up. And when I look at that inventory figure, three months supply. You know, I speak with Jim Gaines at Texas A&M about the Texas market condition, and he said just not enough inventory in the major markets of Texas. Dallas, uh, Austin, I mean Houston is, you know, they're trying to come back from uh, the hurricane impact, but even Houston pre-hurricane, all three major markets, just not enough inventory conditions. So, so even though home building is occurring, even more is required given the strong job growth uh, in the state. This is the home price index in the Austin area. So this is not a medium price, but trying to assess a same home, how that same home prices are changing. And you can see uh, that 1995 to today, prices have tripled. So for anyone who are buying home for a long-term investment, this has been a great deal. I mean, this is your housing equity building up uh, over time. Anyone back in 1995 who had concern, well, is prices a little too high or not, I mean, they missed out on this huge gain. Um, so, the, so the prices have been very good. And, and you, in the, to one degree, you, again, you may say, well, is this a new bubble that's beginning to develop? And I would say no, it is the inventory shortage because uh, underwriting standard is very, very tight, uh, but the prices are running up. And, uh, and furthermore, you have a lot of interaction uh, with California market. Many people from San Jose, San Francisco area are moving to here. Why? They used to work at technology companies, and they said, well, I cannot buy a home in the Bay Area, but I have a technology skill, so where can I find a job? Well, they said in Austin, there's plenty of jobs for technology skill uh, people. So they go to Austin and they look at the prices, and I know you are saying, well, Austin prices have run up so fast, but for Californians, once they come here, they say, wow, these are bargains. You know, they, they want to buy uh, not only one home, but three homes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's such a bargain uh, in Austin. Um, but the prices have a very nice run up uh, in Austin. In the meantime, homeowners are very healthy as well. They are not defaulting. Uh, this is the all the mortgage delinquency rate, people who are in foreclosure or who have missed mortgage payment for more than three months. And what you see in this chart uh, is first the very bottom line, the orange line, is the Veterans Affairs mortgages. First, we want to thank the veterans for service to the country. But also, we want to thank the veterans for not defaulting. So the, the, they're not defaulting here. Um, while the FHA mortgages, you can see that it is higher default rate. And because it is designed so, what do you mean? Well, it is catering to moderate income families, first time buyers, people with less than stellar credit history. So FHA default rates are higher. But you can see it's also trending down. First, we have been using this chart Eight years ago, when Washington discussion was the following, Washington discussion was, let's assure we never have housing market crisis ever again. And how do you prevent it? Well, why don't we just say that to buy a home, people need a 20% down payment minimum. You don't have 20% down payment, forget it, you're not gonna buy a home. So Washington was considering this legislation, but thanks to many realtors who responded to call to action, and also using this chart, we change Washington people's mind to say, no, it's not about down payment. Look at veterans. It is a zero down payment product. 
yet they are not defaulting. And they, the reason why the veterans are not defaulting is first, the lender will assure they don't overstretch their budget. If you want to borrow a large amount of money, forget it, we're not going to give you a VA loan. But if you're going to stay within your budget, we will give you the loan. Uh, and second, there's a lot of counseling involving veterans affairs. So if a soldier misses a payment, uh, somebody will call and try to help out. So a counseling impact. So we said it's not the down payment. And, and because of your response to NAR's call to action, letting the members of Congress know uh, they have just completely backed away and this is no longer a discussion. So it's, it's no longer a discussion. But also, again, note that FHA, it will always be higher default rate because it caters to people on the, a little bit on the margin. But because the default rates have been falling, FHA insurance reserve fund is now much healthier. It's on the positive. It used to be on the negative, but now it's positive. And this is the FHA insurance premium. So as you have some FHA um, uh, clients who use FHA mortgages, you know that there's a premium they have to pay. So premium always have been about point, uh, you can see uh, about 0.5% or so FHA insurance premium, that it increased dramatically when the default rates were rising. And then it began to decline. And then that orange line is what President Obama signed into law back in December to say that, well, FHA insurance reserve fund is much healthier, so let's go ahead and reduce the insurance premium back closer to a historical average. President Trump, after he did a swear in at the uh, Capitol, he walked down the Pennsylvania Avenue, entered the White House, and once he entered the White House, he said, give me a pen. And once he got the pen, he reversed the FHA insurance premium and is now back up on the green uh, line. So what was this about? So we talked, our lobbyists talked with the uh, Trump administration, and uh, President Trump's team said, we have nothing against FHA. What we have against is any executive decision President Obama made after the election results. So any the decision President Obama did after the election result, they're going to reverse it, and, they, and the President Trump's team wants to review on their own. So insurance premium is higher. We have been talking with the HUD secretary, Dr. Ben Carson, about this premium uh, being high. It, it can be reduced. And Ben Carson, well, unfortunately for him, he's been running a skeleton crew at HUD. All his deputy secretaries were not confirmed by the Senate. So he's just running a one-man show, and it's hard to do uh, many things. But now we've been forcing people, uh, you know, Congress to say, confirm this person. So they are beginning to confirm some deputy secretary, including a nomination on FHA commissioner. Uh, and, ben, and Ben Carson said, yes, I want to look at the FHA premium review uh, from my team, and I will then uh, determine what to do. So next thing NAR will be doing is pushing uh, Dr. Ben Carson to say, I think there is a room to reduce the insurance premium because it's much healthier. But uh, stay tuned for that. And if you get called to action on that, uh, to just, you know, if you believe, if you agree with us, uh, press the button. If you don't agree to, uh, with us, you don't have to press the button. And when I say press the button, uh, what it means is that we set up a system to make it very user friendly for realtor members. Essentially, you get an email to say FHA insurance premium or something like this. If you agree, press this button. And if you press it, uh, a letter under your signature would go to your elected member of Congress to say this issue is very, very important. Uh, and, and believe me, Congress respond to how people respond to uh, things. Um, so home prices are rising. Homeowners are much healthier. They are not defaulting. But home ownership rate is stuck at 50-year low. And we have to wonder if this is the direction that we want to go. And also, we often hear about the millennial generation who say, I don't want to be a homeowner. I like renting. I like flexibility. Now, if it is that America's taste and preference has changed and home ownership rate decline reflects changes in people's preference, we have to respect that. We have to respect consumer sovereignty. So we took the survey of consumers, including millennials, about home ownership, and here's what they say. Do you consider owning a home part of your American dream? 80% said yes. Would you consider buying a property at some time in the future? 85% said yes. So you see this home ownership rate and their aspiration, and it's a mismatch. 
NAR has a new CEO. His name is Bob Goldberg. Uh, and he has many great ideas to increase member profitability, uh, to engage more pol politics. I mean, we're very good in lobbying, but we want to increase the intensity level, especially with mortgage interest deduction on the table and, and such. But one of his outside of the office activity he likes to do is attend Bruce Springsteen concert. I believe he attended something like 30 live concert of Bruce Springsteen. I have attended zero. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not necessarily a music person, I'm a bookworm, you know, book person. Uh, but apparently Bruce Springsteen wrote a book recently uh, and there's a lot of book reviews, so I'm looking forward to reading his book. But in the meantime, I'll be reading some of the book reviews, because book reviews are much shorter than the actual books. Uh, and the book review essentially says the following. Some of the lyrics that Bruce Springsteen provide, it touches people's heart, because this is what people sometimes encounter in their life. Certain frustration, they have certain desire, but it's not attainable. Maybe just getting out of, getting out of that greedy, uh, working class neighborhood into the middle class neighborhood. It could be that. It could be chasing the girl, and they can never realize. So whatever it is, they have certain dream, but they are not realizing that dream and that their realization is much below that level, and then that lyric is, many of the lyric is about that situation, the conflict between their desire versus what they, are, what they have. Well, here it is. This is what people have, low home ownership rate, but their desire for home ownership rate is a record high. So, so, you know, this conflict uh, is not something I don't think we as America, as a country, want to see consistent low home ownership rate. So anything that diminishes the attractiveness of home ownership rate, we have to be really concerned about. Um, and one of the factors that's holding back, especially the millennial generation from buying a home, is that we've been conducting jointly with the American Student Debt Association, something like this, uh, and my staff have been working about the impact of student loans. And student loan, by the way, has tripled in the past 10 years. Any data that triples in 10 years, we should be concerned about. Student debt level has tripled in the past 10 years. How is this tripling in student debt impacting your consumer decision? And if you go to the bottom, it says something about, you know, well, I'm not going to start a business. I'm reducing my daily necessities. Uh, I'm not purchasing as much clothes as before, all this. But number one thing that is being impacted is on the top, purchase of a home. Because of a student debt, they are not going to purchase a home. So student debt is a major overhang as to why the millennials are not getting back into the uh, market. Um, so let me quickly now turn to the uh, economy, and then I want to discuss uh, the tax reform just in a little more detail. So economy currently, or let me put it what many people like to view it in, is sort of a presidential term. And I don't even know if this is fair, because sometimes the first year of president is the legacy of the past president. But this is what it looks like. President Ronald Reagan, many people have good nostalgia about the Reagan years. Uh, GDP was growing at 3.5%. Uh, president Bush, first Bush, uh, close to 2%. Then President Clinton came in, it was close to 4%, and also under President Clinton, we had actual budget surplus. If GDP growth very, very fast, many people with jobs, they are paying taxes, uh, we can actually have a budget surplus. Uh, second President Bush came in, close to 2%, President Obama, one and a half. First quarter, President, uh, first quarter of President Trump, very disappointing, less than 1%. Second quarter, after data revision, is actually above 3%. Uh, it's above 3%. Third quarter, which is yet to be released, will be much below 3% because of the hurricane impact, and you, one cannot blame, uh, you, you know, it's an outside force on the hurricane. But the fourth quarter in 2018, well, let's see uh, whether President Trump can deliver his promise to grow GDP by 3%. He will not be in 2017, his first year of presidency, because weak first quarter and the hurricanes. Uh, but let's see what happened in 2018. And he said tax reform is one of the things that can cause 3% GDP growth. Now, one can you know, debate on many minutia of it, uh, but, but you know, we do have some one aspect of concern related to the tax reform. But GDP has been positive, so jobs are being created. This is for the country. And here's Austin. From year 2000 to today, nationwide is an 11% job growth. Austin, 48%, more than four times as fast, almost five times. 
And if you are driving and frustrated about traffic, just remember, strong job growth. This is why you have the traffic jam. So at least have a little comfort uh, the reason. I mean, I think you need to expand highways and other infrastructure developments uh, because you cannot have tra traffic jam consistently. So you need to have more highway uh, development. But nonetheless, the reason why you have traffic jam is essentially this uh, condition. Job openings, record high. This is one of the fortunate things about America. There's job for people who want to work. Now, the question is, can we get those people who are out of the lever force back into the job? You know, and some, I talk with other economists, and we are beginning to talk about oh, the opioid addiction, how negative that is not only personally and for the family, but how that's holding back some economic potential because they're not even in the labor force. But job openings are at record high uh, condition. Uh, and the companies are not laying off people, people filing for unemployment insurance uh, claims. So this assures that we don't have economic recession over the horizon, so job gains will continue. And when the job gains continue, Austin benefits generally even better than the rest of the country. Uh, so very good uh, condition. Uh, but the Federal Reserve will be raising interest rates. They have already started to do so. It has not yet impacted the mortgage rates, but as they continue to increase the short-term rates, inevitably the mortgage rate will be impacted. So the forecast is for somewhat higher mortgage rate in 2018, 2019, specific figure I will go into. Uh, so the forecast, no economic recession. First year of President Trump, 1.7% growth. Next year, something closer to 3%. So let's see uh, whether that uh, plays out. But inflation will begin to kick a little higher, which is the reason why Social Security check adjustment, now there will be cost of living adjustment. Small amount, but it's no longer zero. It used to be zero, but now the cost of living adjustment on Social Security uh, will begin to uh, turn positive. Um, and regarding the housing, Kansas City Federal Reserve estimated this, something called missing households. Uh, this is not a missing person, American one, it's just missing households. Somehow there's fewer people looking to buy a home given the current economic conditions. So the blue is the actual, red is what America should be at based on the current population and job growth. So you have this missing gap, 6.9 million missing households. Who are they? They are young adults living with parents. Even at this phase of economic recovery, they are not popping out of the basement. But we have to say that certainly this cannot possibly be the American dream. So I think at some point they will pop out, and as they pop out, it will be rental demand as well as home buying demand, which means housing demand is solid. As long as we don't have economic recession, housing demand is very solid. The constraint would be housing supply, whether we would have adequate housing supply, new construction, new construction is the bottleneck. Uh, so given that conditions nationwide for new home sales, I have an easy increase because whatever home builders build, they can sell it. That's very, very easy. The existing home sales nationwide, in 2017, I just put fewer because of the hurricane impact, but people who are not impacted by hurricane, it will be higher. I think Austin, at once 2017 figure is finished, it will be somewhat higher compared to 2016, uh, just because the first half was much, much better. The second half is beginning to show a little soft signs, but I think year as a whole, Austin will be on top. But going into next year, pent up housing demand, plus job creation, I think there will be an increase in home sales. So it's a good opportunity in terms of build uh, business prospects. Uh, prices, positive, there's no bubble. It's all about housing shortage, how to relieve it. And in fact, we want prices not to grow so fast because it's challenging the affordability. We want more home construction, more supply to tame the price growth. And the mortgage rate will tick up, but only modestly, nothing uh, alarming. Now, finally, my final slide is about President Trump's uh, policy related to uh, the real estate. Uh, first, we had a call to action on flood insurance earlier part of the year. Thank you very much for people who responded. Again, it's an email to say, if you agree with this, click this button, and a letter under your signature go to your member of Congress. And many people responded, and as a result, they extended the flood insurance availability uh, to December. Then we will probably have another call to action in December, uh, because uh, in case you don't know, in an area that is designated as a flood zone, and there's a 10% of the region, you know, many areas of Houston and Louisiana, 
If you don't have flood insurance, you cannot get a mortgage. If you cannot get a mortgage, you cannot buy a home. Now, some people in non-flood zones say, well, that's not my issue. But trust me, realtors are very helpful in other areas. So realtors help out Californians in terms of the raising the loan limit on FHA so more people can qualify for it. So we say to California, even though you may not have flood, plus the response, so all that helps out. So we think that what is good for real estate, you know, we make it known. The second one is Dodd-Frank. President Trump has clearly indicated that he does not like Dodd-Frank. So some changes to Dodd-Frank, I think at the community bank level will be very positive. More construction loan for home builders, so it will be positive. Fannie and Freddie availability, uh, that will be a 2018 issue. Fannie and Freddie, we believe that it is a very critical to assure that mortgages are available. Uh, and you are wondering uh, when you get the client's mortgage from Bank of America or someplace else, you know, uh, what, why is that mortgage originated? Because they can sell it to Fannie and Freddie. If they cannot sell it to Fannie and Freddie, they may be hesitant about originating those mortgages. So we believe Fannie and Freddie is very important. They did make a mistake in the past, and all those bad managers are all fired. They were trying to create a hedge fund, make huge profit, cost taxpayers huge bundle of money. But those taxpayer bailout money has been all paid back. Now, Fannie and Freddie is going back to their original mission of helping the home ownership and not about the hedge fund. Um, and so, so that will be a critical, uh, important thing in 2018. Uh, let me go to the very bottom, EPA uh, and the land use. Uh, there's always a trade-off. Everyone loves clean water, clean air. But at what cost? I hear from many people in the West to say, I have a large acre of land, I have a pond, I want to develop. But EPA say, no, sorry, you cannot develop because it impacts the water. Uh, but I think you know, there's always trade-off between water, air versus development. And I think President Trump is clearly on the side of the development uh, compared to the environment. You know, that's the trade-off that people uh, make. Now, tax simplification. So here it is. So on your table is the urgent call for action. So what is that about? So the best way I can explain is the following. The tax reform is the following. Simplify, we want that. Simplify uh, and expand the tax base, lower the tax rates, we want that. But in the process, what they're doing is they're raising the standard deduction for the family to 24,000 from current 12,000. And you say, well, what does that mean? Isn't that good for consumers? Well, by raising the standard deduction, it means that more families don't have to use mortgage interest deduction. They say, well, I'm part of the standard deduction. So mortgage interest deduction importance goes away. Who is the biggest winner? The renters. Why? They don't have mortgage interest deduction. They don't have property tax deduction. They just get larger standard deduction automatically. So renters clearly wins out uh, in the uh, tax reform. Some homeowners may win out depending on your special circumstances, but the homeowners with, uh, uh, who have additional family members, many children, they lose their personal exemption, so you have additional child coming into the family, you don't get any benefit from that because all that personal exemptions uh, go away because of higher standard deduction. And our analysis of all the tax records uh, shows that on average, homeowners will probably wind up paying about $500 more in taxes. And we've been sharing this message to the uh, Trump administration, the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan, and the Senate, everyone uh, we wanted to do. And in fact, President Trump was quoted last week as saying, I don't like some aspect of my uh, tax plan. It shows that middle classes will have to pay higher taxes. I don't want any of that. Make sure that, that middle class do not pay higher taxes. So he is indicating he's open to any changes, uh, but we want to make it known that uh, by raising the standard deduction, it clearly benefits the renters and it diminishes the role of the mortgage interest deduction. Now, one does not have to raise the standard deduction. One can keep it as is and lower the tax rates because it enlarges the tax base, simplify it, then the role of the mortgage interest deduction will be there where it begins to tilt people to say, well, do I rent or do I buy? And they say, well, there's a mortgage interest deduction. You know, for some people, not everyone, for some people, that is one of the determining factor of buying rather than renting. Uh, so we have that concern. Uh, and in case you get in the email today or tomorrow about this call to, a uh, call to action, that's what's it about, to say that we like the tax reform, 
but please, mortgage interest deduction, we don't want to diminish that role. So if you agree with us, you press the button. You don't agree with us, you don't have to press the button. And it's not my decision in coming out with this. NAR set up a committee. You know, there's all these committee realtors working among themselves. Uh, they seek our recommendation, what our views are, so we provide that. Uh, just like Brandy at the Austin board level, you know, she gets, uh, the decide, uh, has various committee working at the local issues and uh, many things. So it's at the national uh, level. Um, so that's the one thing that uh, I think that can halt the housing recovery potential. So economics is good, job creation, pent up demand solid, constraint on housing supply, builders hopefully can ramp up production. We want mom and pop back into, into the game. Uh, but we don't want policy change to have unintended consequence. And I think the current tax reform as it stands has some unintended negative consequences for homeowners, and then we want to bring this to attention for the policymakers. Thank you very much for listening, and all the best to you. Thank you. Uh, before, uh, I want to do one thing. Uh, I want to take a photo because it's such a large crowd and I want to thank the Austin uh, board to arrange uh, such a large crowd because what we want to do is we actually share on the, uh, our social media uh, about uh, the, the, the how realtors gather and, and act. The crowd is too large, so I cannot get everyone, so I'm going to just take two. My son, my son knows the panorama. I am just too old for that. So, <laughs> um, so again, uh, thank you very much. Hello, agents from all over the country. Whether you work in a small town or the big city, you manage a ton of details on the homes you list and show. Is that bamboo flooring? How are the schools? Is there a man cave? And the list goes on. But no matter how perfect the floor plan or charming the neighborhood, it's easy to forget the greatest truth about real estate. Homes don't sell themselves. Real estate agents do. It's because you are masters of the art of people the people whose dreams you bring to life. We love you for that. Keep doing exactly what you're doing now and do it more than ever before because now you can leave the details to Real Sweet. You know, that stuff that takes away precious hours from your day, Real Sweet's got that covered. It's an all-in-one tool created to help you capture, communicate, and close. Real Sweet lets you get back to the things you love, connecting with new clients, building personal relationships, and selling homes. And remember, keep doing you. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence Yoon, for that great presentation. And thank you, Abor, for having me here. I'm Kathleen Wason. I um, am with Realtor.com. I, along with the teammate, Dave, Dave Phillips, share the privilege of being your assigned industry relations representative. So I'm here this morning, like I've been in years past, to share a little bit of an update with you about the latest and greatest news going, what's happening at Realtor.com. Um, first of all, traffic is up. Um, year over year, we've seen an increase, and we're up to about 60 million unique users each and every month. Um, your profile traffic, if you recall, back in 2015, Austin was our beta market for relaunching the Realtor.com profiles. Those, that profile traffic, we get millions of users each and every week that are visiting those profiles, visiting your profiles. Um, in addition, we continue to invest in um, our spokesperson, Elizabeth Banks, this year's campaign, the Not You campaign. Uh, is one of my favorites and I think has really helped us to increase that awareness with the consumer that this is a place to come and search for properties. And we also continue to leverage the vast digital media resources of our parent company, News Corp. Real Sweet, which you've just seen the video on, is our latest and greatest. So in addition to being Realtor.com, the property search portal, 
Move, the company that I work for, is a software company that sells software to agents and brokers to help them manage their business. And we've had various different software products that we've acquired over the years, technology startups and so forth. Um, but they were all kind of fragmented and you had to log in here and do this and then you had to log into top producer to do this and then you had to log in over here, your transaction management platform to do this. Real Suite is what is bringing that all together and it will be directly through your realtor.com dashboard where you claim and manage your profile that you will be able to access all of these tools. This was just announced, the brand launch was just announced about exactly a month ago at our results summit in Las Vegas. And at that time there was a call out to a bunch of beta users. So we've got beta users currently using these products all over the country. So look forward to that coming soon. And um, I am going to hand it off now to somebody who has become a friend in this year, your president, um, Brandy Guthrie. I'm pleased to welcome your 2017 Austin Board of Realtors president to the stage. And Brandy will share a review of the ABOR annual report and share more details of the successes your association has achieved on your behalf. All right, well, um, thank you all again for being here and welcome to the annual meeting at the Austin Board of Realtors. Uh, held here is our largest gathering of the year. Uh, we've conveyed this meeting to ensure that every one of our members knows what ABOR is doing to support you in your business and to ensure that Austin remains a great place to live and work. Before I go forward, I would like to recognize a few uh, people in the audience. And so if you are currently serving as an NAR uh, director, uh, for the National Association of Realtors or a TAR director or RVP, will you please stand and be recognized along with the TAR TREPAC trustees? Okay. And if you are serving on the foundation board for the Austin Board of Realtors, will you please stand and be recognized? And then also uh, in the audience today is your board of directors for 2017. Will you all please stand and be recognized? I see one popping behind the curtain back there. Um, please find us when we're out at the trade show today. Uh, that way we have an opportunity to visit with you. We're here for you. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out to us as you see us um, today and moving forward as well. So almost a year ago, I accepted the pledge and duty to support all 12,000 members during our annual installation event. I pledge to put members first in all that I do in leading your board of directors. And while it's been filled with ups and downs, our board has worked very hard to fulfill that pledge. We recognize the work we have to do in order to build your trust and more deeply engage our membership. But we also recognize the tremendous success we've had in 2017. With numerous local and national award highlights, timely programming, new product launches, and continued the day-to-day -day support that you expect, we've had a very strong year. I hope to highlight some of the successes and benefits you've received this year um, with you. And I also want to acknowledge there's a lot of work that still remains. A director's job includes serving as the link between the association and you and that link has been challenged, but we will reconcile by reinforcing our core values of integrity, trust, selflessness, advocacy, effectiveness, and leadership. We're making great strides ensuring you remain connected with your leadership and are engaged in the big decisions facing our local market. And so what you're going to see on the slide is just a little bit of some of the um, transparency and the things that we have been doing uh, for the Board of Directors. You guys are all aware that our meetings are open and you're always welcome to come and speak at any of those and I encourage you to do that as well. And then now you'll be able to find all of the recording of the decisions 
uh, along with the minutes. And so I encourage you guys to check out abor.com because we've done a lot of work there. Um, with just a few weeks left, we do have our annual committee call, That's and I encourage each of you to be part of that process and to sign up for 2018 committee today. It is online as well at abor.com, and this is where you really help shape the future of the association. But join me in taking a look at the past as we review the 2017 annual report, and these were out by the door when you guys first walked in. This year, we've built connections for Central Texas Realtors through the MLS. Specifically, we've made several MLS enhancements, including the implementation of a significant upgrade to the client portal and its new mapping feature. The new client portal is mobile, and the UX has been modernized to meet current design standards. We also launched Transaction Desk, which is a new product suite that's integrated within the Matrix platform to provide you more choice. Fully implemented an MLS reference server, allowing over 221 technology vendors to, and brokers across North America to have one um, access to our database, which is one-year-old live data. This reference server concept garnered ABOR significant national presence and recognition and included us being nominated as an Inman finalist for the Innovators Award. We also implemented field changes for the day-to-day -day operations when using the MLS to help improve lease property class, including 32 fields, 28 modified fields, and 14 deleted fields. Improve the reach of your listings after reaching consensus to execute a publisher agreement with Zillow Group using data policy guidelines and improved, improved contract guidelines as well. And then we implemented a new product review tool called BetMe, which I'm personally very proud of. It enables a greater transparency in our vendor selection process and increases the opportunity for members uh, to test the products and to um, determine whether or not they will be useful for our members. We also achieved the platinum certification with Real Estate Standards Organization, which is known as RESO meaning your MLS system contributes to an orderly marketplace and an innovative technology. And of course, just last month, Austin Shine is the national host for the Council of MLSs, where we were able to bring everyone around from the country. As a national leader in the industry, ABOR empowers you every day by connecting you to the latest technology to enhance your business. We're committed at being at the forefront of MLS technology to continually improve this crucial business resource for you. And these are just a few of the things that we've done this year. We're leveraging our greatest asset as a means of driving value for our members and revenue for our association. For example, more than half of the events hosted at the Canyon View Event Center, the new building, were member events where they received a 25% member discount, helping to build their businesses. We've also supported numerous nonprofit organizations, local government officials at the building to help strengthen the community and our advocacy and the, build those relationships. But our building is so much more than just a building. It's a tool we can use to help strengthen your businesses and cement ABOR's position as a leader in the Austin community. Our deepest community engagement is found in the ABOR Foundation. The ABOR Foundation has achieved goals in all three areas of their focus and their mission by aiding the victims of the recent Harvey floods across our state, building a house in 10 days with Habitat for Humanity, and handing out college scholarships to deserving Central Texas students. The ABOR Foundation has been an impactful partner and were recently actually named a Public Partner of the Year by the National Red Cross. We're also building connections for our members to one another for unparalleled training and professional development ABOR launched its first ever broker exam prep course, which is a two-day comprehensive course that ensures you're going to be ready to tackle the exam to obtain your broker's license. And for the second year in the row, we graduated more GRI designees than any other association across the state. We've held seven forums, town halls in 2017, and topics range from protecting listing property photos, code next, and challenges with professionalism within the industry. All the forums were streamlined and also, excuse me, live streamed, and including both the town halls at uh, various locations in the ABOR headquarters. 
In collaboration with our new diversity committee, ABOR has developed a comprehensive group of all realtor partner organizations that support membership diversity and has engaged the leadership of these groups to approach, to approach diversity challenges we face. And this includes Women's Council, AREP, um, the Austin Young Real Estate Professionals, just to kind of name a few. In addition, we were able to add a new group this year, which is the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals, VAREP, -E VAREP, as an ABOR strategic partner. And of course, we remain your go-to source for the continuing education by offering over 1,500 hours of CE with a 25% increase in the number of free courses that we've offered this year. In early 2017, ABOR was awarded the 2016 Innovative Program of the Year from the Texas Association of Realtors and also uh, received an award for a class that was called Agent and Consumer Advocacy. We recognize that one of the best ways we can support you is to make sure we're informed about the best ways to work with one another, and we've made great strides this year to achieve that goal in a way that fits with your day-to-day -day realities. We're particularly proud of the connections we've built this year with the public and within the community. Our work in the realm of public policy has been significant this year. Your ABOR leadership and staff has participated in over 175 meetings with city leaders to ensure our voice is heard and that our industry is protected. In addition to one of those being a cornerstone issue that's facing the city of Austin is Code Next. And we've been engaged with a number of additional policy issues out throughout the year. A proposal to lower the bar, for, for example, a proposal to lower the bar for establishing historic zoning against the wishes of property owners, proposed amendments to the International Property Maintenance Code, and a proposed mandatory disclosure in Austin properties that are within a certain distance of licensed outdoor music venues. On the state level, ABOR took over 75 realtors to the TAR State Hill visits, where we were able to join over 2,000 of our colleagues from all across the state of Texas to talk about the industry and the items that were important to us. This year's largest issue is Coast Next, which is the overhaul of the Land Development Code. We've leveraged financial contributions of our local PAC, TAR, and NAR Issues Mobilization Fund to help fully engage in shaping Austin's future. The Growth and Development Team, a policy team of the Legislative Management Team, has had many meetings to help educate our members about what's taking place. The goal of these activities has been to cultivate a core group of realtors who are especially informed and equipped to lead discussions among colleagues and homeowners about the importance of Code Next and what the impacts are. Please join me in watching a short video related to Code Next. Congratulations, you just helped the Joneses buy their dream home. What a slog. It seems like every home in this town has a full-fledged bidding war but you finally found a great location, and boy, are they happy. What you weren't expecting is a return call in a few months. You remember how they wanted to put an apartment above the garage for Mrs. Jones's parents to visit? Turns out the city denied their permit. You didn't know their lot wasn't zoned for secondary units. To make matters worse, the new neighbor, Chad, runs a nights and weekends recording studio out of his garage, and the Joneses swear they haven't slept since they moved in. Somehow, a city inspector just told them that under the current zoning, Chad's garage studio is okay, even though the garage apartment isn't allowed. How does that make any sense? If only Austin's land development code wasn't such a nightmare, you may have helped the Joneses find out about these problems ahead of time. What's more, it's not just you noticing the lack of well-priced listings. Austin's newcomers are snatching them all up right away, driving prices way up and available inventory way down. Our current code doesn't have the right tools to manage this kind of growth so realtors are working harder than ever for a piece of the shrinking pie. Transparent zoning rules would have given Mrs. Jones the bad news about her garage apartment before they ever even made the purchase. By adding more transparency to the code, not only do you avoid that disappointed call from the Joneses, but you'd get the referral so you can help the Smiths find their dream home too. 
and Austin actually has enough affordable houses to make it happen. Enter Code Next, the city's initiative to revise the entire code for the first time in 30 years. The Austin Board of Realtors is fighting to make sure this new code is done right. That means not only transparency, but a code that is supportive of abundant housing in all parts of town for all kinds of people. Creating more housing flexibility with options like duplexes, triplexes, and townhomes give Austinites a range of options to live, work, and play. That way, this time around, our rapidly changing market has the right tools to manage our growth. 20 years down the line, when little John is off to college and the Joneses don't need such a big place, they'll call you to sell off that old dream home. They'll have plenty of options in town for their perfect retirement home. And they'll finally be able to build that extra apartment. Only this time, it's for when the kids come home to visit. For more information about ABOR's advocacy for the new code that meets these standards, visit abor.com slash code next. So that's just one of the ways that um, we're engaging members. We're going to be launching a website. Please check out that, um, that link that was posted. As we get more data, we'll be sending it over to you. There will be a point in time in the near future where every single homeowner in Austin will get a zoning change. And that will be the opportunity for us to be knowledgeable, to be able to help our clients, our, our buyers and sellers as well. Um, to understand what it is that they have the ability to do with their property and what it means for their property values. So for the second year in a row, ABOR offered community-facing trainings facilitated by trained realtors. Four workshops were offered in the city of Austin in districts 2, 4, and two, four 5, and 10, along with a workshop done in partnership with the Austin Re Revitalization Authority in District 1. These workshops allowed homeowners to connect with realtors to learn more about the property tax process and to learn about how realtors can help them with their property tax protests. You all showed up in a big way this year when it comes to investing in your profession, matching the high watermark of TREEPAC contributions of almost $400,000 to protect our private property rights. Lastly, ABOR is a proud supporter of the Travis County and AISD bond programs on the ballot this fall and the statewide Proposition 2. This bond programs ensure investments in infrastructure and public education are made to preserve the quality of life in Central Texas. Proposition 2 is focused on ensuring transparency in home equity lending laws and offering consumer protections that will enable owners to have better access without jeopardizing market stability. So early voting is going to begin on October 23rd. It's going to be very uh, important to, to get out and vote. I believe there's information in the trade show related to all of the bonds that will be on the ballot, including the Prop 2 that's supported by the Texas Association of Realtors. So please get educated on that and, and vote. It's also important to speak up for the place that we all call home. And we've done that in every single since in 2017 and will continue to do so. The Austin Board of Realtors maintains the financial integrity of the association through the Board of Directors, adoption of an annual budget, and quarterly financial statement reviews. The budget is designed to meet the goals established in ABOR's strategic plan and maximizes the benefits and programs available for members. Through streamlined operations and focused financial review, ABOR has been able to maximize the level of the level of service provided without increasing members' annual dues of 125. In fact, your annual dues for ABOR membership has not been increased since 1977. This is the time of big changes and evolution for both ABOR and Central Texas real estate. 2018 will be an important year for ABOR and its future, and we need your unique input, perspective, and support. Let's chart ABOR's future together, and let's do that by having you volunteer and get engaged, and you can have a real impact lasting on your profession and our industry. If someone were to ask me if I knew what would happen during my year, I would not have known how it would have turned out. However, I've always known that I search and I serve each day to represent our membership. With every thought and action, we protect the organization to which we have a fiduciary to and which exists to serve our members. 
It was not by accident that my slogan this year was members focused, members connected. I believe and always have that our members need a voice at the table. And this is ultimately why I decided to get involved and stop sitting on the sidelines. The beauty in having gone through all of this together is you are more focused on what's happening, more connected and engaged. I hope more of you will be involved and have your voice heard and be a symbol of positive change for our future together. I'm a firm believer in to always be learning and there's always an opportunity to be better and improve. We've heard from some of you and we need you. I encourage you all to be part of the process and to get engaged and involved by joining a committee at ABOR, which signups are still taking place. There's always an insight to be gained or a way to improve, to always listen, to maintain decorum and professionalism, and to do this with high level of integrity and responsibility. I believe now is the time to continue building on our accomplishments over the years and this year, build on and mend the relationships, continue to give our members a voice and to be heard, and to be focused on the future for we all represent and, say, and serve which is our association, our members, and our community. I am proud and honored to have served you all, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. It's never been one taken lightly, and there's so much to be thankful for as we move into a new year with a new board, a new CEO, and the positive outcome of change. It has been my privilege to have worked with the leaders of this organization, the board of directors, committees, all our volunteers and our staff who all truly care. I am thankful to all the members who have reached out to me and have taken an interest into what's happening and being engaged and being involved. I look forward to a bright future with the opportunity to heal, bring us all together and continue to serve. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have a fabulous rest of the day. There's a lot of great booths and information that will be out there for you. There's going to be prizes, and there will actually be, um, you have to turn in your card for the grand prize by 3 o'clock, so make sure that you do that, and uh, they'll do those selections at about 345. And I will be around along with the other directors, so please say hello and go enjoy the trade show.